Hey there, folks! Welcome to yet another episode of Homo Vulgaris. Uh, with us today is Dr. Shoggoth. Hello, people. And technical difficulties busters. I might disappear from this episode very suddenly, so just a heads up there. And I, of course, am your very favorite person in the universe, Jesus Christ. That oh, you know, I was really hoping Psych. this weren't coming back anytime yeah. soon. You got a lot to answer for. Yeah, you, you really, you boned some things up. Man, if I would be the most disappointing messiah. Well, uh, speaking of messiahs, I think we should jump right in with uh, a theological and anthropological stuff of one of uh, North America's greater subcultures. Shogs, why don't you talk about the uh, insane clown posse for a bit? The Juggalos will be on the forefront of the workers' revolution that is coming. And in fact, they may be the prison guards at the gulags that we send the 1% to. It's one thing I kind of like about Juggalos is their sort of slacker attitude, their rejection of societal norms, and, and their decision to embrace their own uh, kind of self-selecting outcast culture united by symbology of clowns and horror films and dissonant and interesting rap music. So uh, for those of you who might not have your doctorate in juggalo anthropology like myself, um, the central kind of uh, mythos revolves around a uh, dark carnival, an afterlife world uh, ruled over by um, totem-like spirits from their tarot card deck. Um, and only true believers will be allowed into the dark carnival. And there's only a few things you can do to get kicked out because it's pretty inclusive but you got to be down with the clown it really is on some level an offshoot of evangelical christianity isn't it uh there there's a there's a hell ruled over by a kind of satan judge the wrath the wraith sorry the wraith huh called having a job oh no 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 that's uh that's the um uh, the riddle box, I think, or the oh. no, the great, the great Malenko is actually one of their totems. Uh, he is an illusionist and necromancer. He tries to play tricks on people and tricks people into greed and other lesser sins. So he's the guy who's going to say, "Hey, man, get that job and rat out Donnie, who's growing weed out of the back of his trailer, so you can get in good with the cops." That's that. That's uh, one of their. Or trickster gods. So you're saying the great Malenko is the man. Yeah, well, kind of. He it, likes to. He, he's he's a tempter, a tempter of weak minds. He's the Narlehotep to the man's he's, Azatoth. He's really the Loki, Loki, sorry, of uh, their uh, pantheon. Now, who is the uh, gibbering clown uh, of atomic fusion at the center of the universe that spreads, radiates madness, and from this madness creates the illusion of order that coalesces into our feeble human minds who can't understand the elder mysteries of the dark carnival? That would be Bang Pow Boom, the first card of the second deck of the dark carnival. Uh-huh. Is- a sort it's of Big Bang kind of figure. It is, in fact, an entity that caused a continuous explosion to clear the carnival crowns when they become too crowded with the souls of evil. Interesting. So, yeah. No, I mean, you can you can look this stuff up. There, there is a, a juggalo theology, and it's really, I mean, it's it's very very inclusive. The sins are mostly um, harm to other people, um, but the response to the uh to the deadly sins are uh kind of over the top like they're fake sociopathy hatchet man kind of uh instant karmic retribution stuff i had a friend who uh was hanging out with some juggalos and he without permission drank the last of the fago and did wake up uh with a with a meat cleaver uh, firmly impl- embedded into his skull. So they do sometimes go a little zealous in the whole law and order game. Well, but I, I suppose that might stem from them kind of having to create their own law and order as people who are a outcast from or reject society and uh, probably have issues with the legal system. So the cardinal sins of the Juggalo pantheon are um, usually, usually abuses of power. Uh, pedophilia, racism, bigotry, but specifically domestic violence and uh, sexual assault. Oh. So, yeah. so they're, they're a step ahead of the Christians in that game. Yeah, no, it sounds like domestic it. violence stuff, yeah. 
I imagine Juggalos would, you know, probably run a pretty, pretty, pretty fun women's shelter if they had the opportunity. Um, a fun women's shelter. But back in as fun as that's going to be. Back in 2002, a lot of Juggalos were disappointed when Joseph Bruce he revealed that the the hidden message was to follow the the Christian God. Well, death of the author. But the way of your fellowship is up to every individual ninja to find his own way. So that's very positive. Yeah, I've always found I, I, I trash on juggalos on the internet because everybody else was doing it. And that miracle song was really fucking stupid. Yeah. But uh I've come to reconsider that I was probably in the wrong there because most juggalos I've met are are, are fun. Uh, they're kind of trashy, but they embrace that, that they own that. That's kind of they draw strength. From the fact that they're kind of disenfranchised, usually white. One of their more recent al- uh, solos called uh, When I'm Clowning. No, I, I it saw features, it. Listen to the other. It features a very brilliant solo by like Danny Brown. It's it's really it's really good. And the uh, the whole thing, you're, I think you'd really enjoy it because it's really going back to the roots of uh, ICP. There's less talk about bashing skulls and then more talk about traditional clownery, like pies to the face and falling down and yeah, that sort of thing. Oh man, like when you have a flower pinned to your chest, but it's actually a squirt gun. Right, right. I mean, they go a little dark with it, you know, but but at the same time, it, it, it seems to be celebrating the spirit of fun that is at the core of uh, clownery that, that often gets lost, even outside of uh, insane clown policy uh, <laughs> culture. Because, yeah, they, they kind of prey off the images of clowns as, as scary, as frightening horror movie kind of uh, creations. But there's, there's multiple ways to view uh, any philosophy. <laughs> I've always found 
the insane clown posse and juggalos to be more acceptable than like clowns from a circus or a birthday party. I, yeah. I find those to be upsetting. Well, in any case, um, I don't I don't know if they'd be the clowns would be down with uh, socialism, but they're they they have their own little kind of socialist bartery utopia every year at the gathering. And so I mean, if they could turn the whole world into the gathering, I'm sure they think that would be. A great idea. This is at the uh, the subgenius end of the world X Day Festival kind of made me made me reconsider the the ju- gathering of the Juggalos as a kind of temporary autonomous zone where where the where you can practice a certain amount of a lifestyle anarchism devoid from the con- constrictions of a society that you find repugnant or which finds you repugnant. I'm not also, a big I'm think? not a big a proponent of the idea that lookism exists. But it, it sort of does, you know. People are going to severely judge you just based on your appearance. And you can improve your appearance to a degree, but for some of us, we're kind of stuck with what we got. Ain't that the truth? And and for, for those of you who've, you know, maybe been on the lower income side and forced to survive off of non-nutritious meals. Maybe you don't have time to prepare meals between two jobs, so you eat a lot of fast food. You're going to end up looking a certain way, and society is going to reject you for it. Yeah, they'll, they'll make you live that way, and then they'll hate you for becoming what they made you. Right. The only truly despicable uh, bits of insane clown posse are their... their they're faux psychopathy. They're like, oh, I'm so crazy. I'm so dark. I'm so edgy. I'll catch you. It's like, yeah, you're really trying too hard to scare me, buddy. And then when they actually do get violent, it's it's sort of vulgar and this kind of gross mob mentality stuff. Like uh, one of the great gathering traditions is they will invite a guest that does not belong at the gathering intentionally so that the crowd oh. can ridicule them. Who did they Which do that to that was kind of high profile? Tia Tequila. Tequila. Yeah. But she's a Nazi. and we She's a literal her. Nazi, yeah. Right. Yeah, she, so, well, she's also like a severe sufferer of mental illness caused, brought on by brain damage. But. Well, they've done it before. It used to only uh, happen in their wrestling kind of thing. They'd always bring a really big heel or a unpopular mainstream wrestler, and they'd get batteries thrown at them and things like that. Really, really kind of despicable behavior. The one that backfired, though, is they, they invited uh, Andrew WCK. Is that his name, right? Andrew K. Yeah, I'm thinking of it. I don't know why I have Louis Yeah, that fucking nerd. Yeah, they invited him to the gathering, uh, to be the outcast of the year, and he started his set, and they started booing and throwing things. Uh, he loved it. He loved it. He fed off of it. He started slapping stuff out of the air, like jumping up and like slapping his enemies. He says, "I don't care how you feel about me right now. I love you guys. Let's have a party. You guys know how to throw a party, right?" And uh, about I'd say like twenty five percent of the crowd started turning the other way. And they're like, you know what? This guy, he just wants to have a good time. And he's kind of weird and kind of straight edge and kind of lame. But at the end of the day, he just wants to have a good time too. So why should we hate on him? Yeah, much much like the Juggalos themselves. Yeah, right. like we should embrace the weirdos and the outcasts because ultimately aren't they the ones that... Yeah, you're losing, I, I don't know you're losing that now. We should embrace difference because... Uh, no. I was going to say, aren't they the ones that we are fighting for? But then I wasn't really sure what we would mean. I guess yeah. broadly, like, like leftist, progressive people. But inclusionary <sighs> philosophy, I don't know. It, it, it goes, it goes pretty far, and it, it would be nice to be included, but it, it, it goes against what I think is basic human nature. So it rarely works. I mean, uh, people are like colors of paint, right? Like it's a it's a more interesting world when you've got a lot of when you've got a lot of different shades to work with. I think our simian brains are really good at identifying patterns, and that's how we've learned to survive. And things that ex- uh, fall out of those patterns trigger fear responses in us because we can't put whatever it is in a little bit of box. So if no, I see someone right. and I go, "It's not like me," fear, hate it, get it out of here. Yeah, it's like, can, can I eat this or can I fuck this? And, and if you don't know if you can eat it or if you can fuck it, you start to get confused and scared. Right, because then it could eat or fuck you. Yeah, oh, holy shit, like a bear. Yeah. Right, right. You see a bear and you don't... Bears yeah. will eat you and fuck you. Not always in either order. I rarely I, fuck you, but... I, you know it's more dangerous than a bear? Like, as an aggregate, in terms of how many of them, like, kill and injure people? Mankind. Well, okay, yeah, obviously. But I, I was going to say a moose. Mm-hmm. You're actually more really? likely to get like fucked up by a moose than a bear on average, at least in the country. 
in the environments I live in. I, I, I was hoping you'd say a dinosaur so we could segue into um, some pictures we were looking at, um, which were allegedly drawn by a young um, a young Trump child. The young Trump. The young, the younger Trump. Oh yes, uh, little little Baron Trump. Little Baron Trump. American uh, sweetheart. What was it? Buzzfeed or some clickbait thing? They found these alleged photos of uh, of scantily clad women that were crudely drawn by a child and claimed that they are uh, Baron Trumps. Uh, oh yeah, like it's it's pen and felt marker stuff. Right. It's really good. Uh, it's really, it's really like what you drew in the sixth grade when, when you got a sheet of printer paper and uh, some markers. Oh, it's, Except, it's like something out of heavy metal magazine, just you know, executed at a child's level. Right. And so it's allegedly drawn by. Uh, I kind of, I kind of blew the cover on this one myself when I looked at the dates on these, which were 2006, which mean uh, either these are fake or Baron Trump is a, a mastermind who was drawing this stuff at three, but whoever was drawing these is, is clearly an exceptional person. And I applaud them for their, their efforts in uh, trying to express creatively the things that they enjoy, which appear to be dinosaurs and women with large breasts. It's and I mean, who doesn't? Well, uh, it, yeah, right. Prepubescents don't generally have such an interest in secondary sexual characteristics in the fairer uh, sex. Well, I mean, at that age, you're still yearning for the milk, aren't you? Well, you oh, know, you never like, it's not that. a sexual thing. It's just, oh man, a food bag. It's a shame this this is kind of spreading around the internet as as kind of a a, a malicious rumor. Not that I, the Trumps need any defending, but it's like I, even if this was drawn by Baron Trump. It's like, who didn't draw? Like, I remember I used to get these sheets of paper, and I would draw, I called them super guns. They were guns with other guns on top, like, glued to them and, like, chainsaw. Like, like they were an amalgam of violence, all in the form of one. And the longer sheet of printer paper that I could get, the larger the super gun became. And so you could have, like, a three-foot-long gun with guns and chainsaws and bear traps like that's what i drew oh dude i i used to get those concerned comments from teachers all the time about my doodles and the doodles that weren't mine because my dad's a doodler and he would get distracted and doodle on my homework right <laughs> right so if this isn't sex it's violence you're drawing at that age and it's just like you know that's what you draw you draw i used to draw these well, they were like pit they were like death trap things they're just like this is this is the ultimate trap you know i didn't i wasn't necessarily trying to trap people but i'm like if i had to make a booby trap what would be the ultimate booby trap it would have like sharks in it and lasers and and a machine that mesh things up like like a bad james bond film that's what yeah. i'm drawing or the first best all, james bond. right I don't think a really good james bond film actually first of all i don't think any of the trump kids were breastfed second of all yeah probably uh, not no i mean i i think there are complications in the uh, augmented anatomies of the trump matriarchs that, that could lead to uh cessation of the uh, lactation. Well, You're going to end that, up drinking saline solution, not milk. Yeah. I was, I, was, I was saying that I think, you know, if, if these were real, that I mean, it could just cause from little Baron walked into one of daddy's parties and saw some pretty ladies who weren't wearing much and had a pretty profound impact on a young kid. Like, that could be and, it. Like, I was under the impression he just, like, sits around watching TV all day. Right, he's got a tablet with Minecraft on it, and that's it, man. I feel kind of sorry for that kid. Like, I, I, I'll i make fun of him. Cause fuck that whole, like, you don't make fun of kid bullshit. But I feel kind of sorry for that little that little spud. Right, he's done nothing wrong himself. Yeah, no, no he's, he's, he's just gone. a victim of circumstance. Like, I mean, he's going right. to turn out to be some kind of, like, psycho monster when he's an adult. Like, he's not like on his, a track to, to Like his brothers, out. Chad and Thargle. Like, they're... they're, <laughs> they're they're lizard people. They grew up in like the unworld of of consumer politics, and they aren't even people anymore. They're they're walking suits and whitened teeth. Like, they're, oh, they're, and, they're Patrick Bateman. If Patrick Bateman was dropped on his head as a kid, yeah. Now, what if Patrick Bateman was autistic and really into trains? Right, right. You have Baron Trump. 
We'll find out. Just wait a few years. We'll, we'll figure it out. Oh man, I want to see that American Psycho sequel. Be like this. This recording is of a, a forty-five gallon steamer coming down the tracks. Some people say it's one of the greatest works that ever traveled the railway. And then there's like hard. a woman tied up to the tracks, but he never mentions her. Right, right. He likes Sonichu. I found the first five issues were a little standard, typical autistic <laughs> scribblings. However, with issue six, Chris Chandler really came into his own as an artist. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I know we're saving Chris Chan, but I think if we're going to be talk topical at all, I think we should maybe consider talking about Kiwi Farms. How do you feel about that? Yeah, it's, oh, uh, rest in peace yeah. or not. Good rest. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Kiwi Farms was a uh, troll-based site that first started out around Chris, moved on to other things, moved on, got very, very large, irritated a lot of people, and then just this week got shut down after the creator... Well, there's a lot of speculations about why it got shut down, but the creator says someone crossed the line and he's too afraid to own the site anymore. Welcome to the internet, folks. Right. You know, um, when Lomtax got the Secret Service called on him, he didn't shut down something awful. Yeah, but right. he makes money off something awful. I don't, I don't know if anyone makes money off Kiwi uh, Farms. They make quite a bit in donations, actually. Well, maybe oh, not really? profit, but uh, enough to keep the site up by itself and enough to... Uh, Buy, buy Noel a few video games occasionally. It's pretty bad if you got a whole forum just dedicated to trolling one autistic person, systematically gang-stalking and driving them to madness. Now, that's a little creepy and obsessive. What if we had a forum where we did that with a lot of weirdos? Right. That's and crazy. the yeah. shutdown has made a lot of weirdos really happy. I mean, over the course of its history, it's had several attempts uh, for people to shut it down. Uh, legal pursuits, which got nowhere. Internet law is hilarious at best um, and ineffective at the worst. And finally, it shut down. So a lot of people are uh, dancing in the streets over this one. A, a rare win for the weird people who don't know how to stop posting. Right, right. Like the kind of people that had to respond every time or or, or yeah. else. Um, it's interesting. The allegedly uh, the site was shut down by a person by the name of Vordak, and he's got his own story, which is very complex. He he received some attention from Kiwi Farms and didn't like it, and it, he made it his mission to shut them down. And unlike so many others, he was successful. The funny thing, the funny thing is to me about these sites like this, because this is not a new phenomenon. This this goes back at least a decade. Like not just making fun of internet weirdos, but the the cattle, the the detailed cataloging of internet weirdos and like organized attempt to get them to do some new funny stupid thing by fucking with them. And what's always been interesting to me is that all of these communities, including especially maybe Kiwi Farms or Encyclopedia Dramatica or what have you, all of the people that populate these things are really no different from the people they make fun of, except they're just never became high profile enough to become targets themselves. Well, I feel like Kiwi Farms was a great, great way. They, they were actually pretty good about expo exploiting that. Once they found one of their own was particularly active, they'd poke and prod until they got enough information and reaction, and then they'd instead of becoming a part of the form, they'd become subject to it. Yeah, yeah I wonder where they to... learned that trick. That's where I got away from the fucking, uh, well, that's why I don't like the troll culture thing anymore, because it's so, uh, it's so conservative. It's so it's fucking, so, it's so crude and disgusting. Like, ooh, it's a, it's a weirdo, uh, but you know, a bunch of fucking, like, like, yeah, you know, alt-right little Pepe fucks. This is like thinking some, who, who's hanging around here, like, doing no fap or all fap there's probably not much middle ground and then they, they they find somebody who's maybe got a weird hobby or a weird sexual proclivity like or the guy that the fucking uh collects toilets it might not yeah. even it might not even be a sexual thing he just collects toilets just somebody doing something a little odd and then they just want to just dogpile them and start treating them like there's some kind of crime against humanity well uh in any case the uh Allegedly, and a lot of this is speculation, a lot of what I'm going to say in regards to the uh, events that closed Kiwi Farms is speculation, but allegedly... The, so allegedly, but almost certainly. Yeah, the, the reason Vordak succeeded where so many other angry emails and threats failed was that he was willing to step into the territory of the trolls himself and do incredibly unethical things, uh, which would be uh, sending 
uh, mass mailing campaigns to people close to uh, the owner, Noel, and his family and people that employed his family, alleging that uh, Noel was a pedophile. And in any Western culture, anyone who harbors a pedophile is um, as bad as a witch themselves. I'd not be uh, surprised at all to find out that uh, trolls who run large troll organizations for harassing weirdos are just using it to cover up their own pedophilia. Oh, it's I mean, it's usually it's there's a lot of projection involved. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, especially in Vortex's case, allegedly he's got some history in that area. But the point of it was, you know, um, Noel got scared and he moved back into his mom's basement in Bel Air, or never left, and his mom kind of told him to shut it all down. Whatever he claims that Noel claims that there are copies of the site uh, in the hands of administrators and that they might see a revival. Although usually we see splinter groups and things like this pop up within the first week, and we haven't yet. Yeah, it'll be interesting because I, I mean, there's no way that many people who who are that engaged and have almost certainly built a community around it will not find a new home. Uh, one of the things that happened this week was someone actually set up a uh, a fishing site for Kiwi Farms, rather clever just copied the CSS and said, oh, we'll put the data back in later, but just re-register your accounts. So, of course, people registered their old accounts on a completely unsecure site. Beautiful. Yeah. Kiwi Farms, because of the problems we've had, we're going to have to do a verification of our members. We're going to need your social, your credit card number, your bank account, and your routing number. Right. Oh, man, that'd be a pretty good scam, actually. Well, I mean, that's unfortunately straight up illegal, unlike well, the best scams. The, I mean, what they got out of this particular scam, anyone who's dumb enough to fall for that, probably is dumb enough to use a similar password and email for whatever accounts they're registering for. So, yeah. well, who knows? I get so fucking self righteous about yeah. themselves. Like, when you, like, like, uh, I remember when, like, any, any rumbling that, like, oh, maybe we should do something about cyberbullying because it drives people to insanity and suicide sometimes. And then they just all s- screech, like, 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 uh, like, like I, I don't even know. Just, ah, I'm just, ugh. honestly, like, I don't see anything wrong with laughing at internet weirdos from the privacy of your own website or, cataloging the things they do just don't interfere with their actual lives just le- leave them be and observe at a distance well even cataloging in a way in a way cataloging is a bit because because say you are you lilia and you degrease pizzas and can do the fifth unit of pie in your head and know all the hex codes for the color of the rainbow yeah, say you're that kid, and you're not already obsessively documenting yourself, and then you stumble onto people obsessively documenting you, and you go, "Why?" and you got to react to it. No, I guess that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably but, weird thing to go on the internet one day and find a wiki about yourself. Right, exactly. Especially if your your whole life is tied up in internet shenanigans as it already is. There, but for the grace of God, I feel like we should touch upon um, things that are happening. Because, you know, dehumanization and the destruction of the individual and getting all zucked out doesn't just come from the Internet. It comes no. from, from our elected representatives in Washington. We learned, we learned well. Yeah. So how about that Donald Trump? He's, he's really executive ordering up a storm this week. Yeah. Oh, not- boy, has it just been a cavalcade of atrocities. Woo! You know, I just- can't say the guy doesn't keep his campaign promises. Yeah, see that that's uh that was my hope going into his um his regime was that uh either he would be a complete milk toast generic um GOP leader or uh and then that would just be the status quo or he'd uh he'd keep his promises, which would be extreme and bizarre and cause a huge outcry. So I I saw something reported on a legitimate news outlet, but I, it was like the Chicago Tribune or something like that. Apparently, people from Mexico are also fa- having trouble getting into the United States now. This is something just from a couple hours ago. I, I, I don't know if it's a deliberate act on part of the administration or just a byproduct of the fact that Mexican and Muslim both start with M, but... And are brown. Don't forget yeah, that. That's brown. a big part of it. Well, no, we I haven't heard anything now. about uh, people struggling to get back into Mexico. I, I I don't think many people who have supported the wall have actually thought through 
the effects of a wall actually impeding travel. I mean, if we were back in the feudal era and the only way to get over a wall was a trebuchet, maybe we'd be doing something by building a wall. If we were stopping Mongolians from centuries ago, a wall would be a great idea, but uh, there's, there's ways around the wall. Yeah, the, the people emigrating from Mexico aren't exactly coming over the border with hordes of cavalry. Right. But I mean, of course, obviously it has nothing to do with whether or not it works, right? This all begins and ends with feelings and right. impulses and symbolism. And it's the idea of a wall that is just insanely appealing. I mean, do you guys want to, speaking of Trump and his support base and the insane phobias and neuroses that are driving these decisions, do you want to talk about white genocide, my favorite genocide? So it's you can't see or feel it, but it's in the air. See, if we can just explain to POCs the beauty of our juggalo culture, we could prevent this white genocide. But instead, people keep trying to bring up like, well, what about Hillary Clinton or, or what about what about what about Arcade Fire or Iron and Wine or Mumford and his sons? Like the, the things that make people the music of Brett Denon, things that make a pretty compelling argument in favor of white genocide. I mean, that's what Phil Collins was singing about, right? When he said he could feel it coming in the air tonight. Right. Race war. Yeah. Rahoa. But uh, for, for the listeners who haven't heard the term, white genocide is a thing Nazis say uh, because in America, in the relatively near future, white people will become a minority just as a byproduct of demographic changes. Just, you know, and, who's breeding and, and who's moving where. And they well, think that means genocide. The, the the incredibly horrible concept of interbreeding is what's going to kill off the whites. It's it's well, yeah, not they're it's gonna, they're gonna all turn to fish people. It's going to ruin the gold smelting business in Innsmouth. We, we should have never listened to, to old man Marsh when he came in talking about how these deep ones were going to make Innsmouth great again with their gold and their no, they were really hot. gods. Really now hot. they're yeah they were hot and our women couldn't resist them. Well the uh, the Big <laughs> So the, the fish sticks, wonderful. The, the, I don't know. I don't know where you're going with this concept, but it's not, it's not like as if, you know, white people are going to get forced into a gulag. What they're really talking about is the absurd eugenics of, uh, the Ubermensch, the the ultimate white Aryan race, getting wiped out by interbreeding. It's not. It, it's weird to even use the word genocide from their viewpoint because it's not as if people are getting killed. Yeah, it's not people getting killed or forcibly relocated. It's just. What, I don't even think it's necessarily inbreeding. It's they're afraid that being outbred and out immigrated means that when white people are no longer a majority that white supremacy is just going to be replaced by another racial supremacy. I think that's their the, the root of that anxiety is that, oh, if, if there's Hispanics, enough Hispanics and black people to outnumber us, then they're going to do to do to us what we've been doing to them that we deny we've ever done to them. Terrifying. It's kind of weird to be afraid of it, isn't it? If you think that, uh, if, if you know, oh, we don't do that, but they're going to do that exact, that exact thing. That we've been saying that we've never done. The, the, the weird double thing. Well, they'll start like citing historical precedents of events they approve of to, to say something should not happen. Also, it's not even as sexy as outbreeding. Like it's if there's it's like if there's a black dude in the new Star Wars movie. If there's a black stormtrooper, that's white genocide too. Yeah, yeah. Or um, or or oh, the the new version of Spider Man, which takes place in a parallel universe because they all do. Um, is a black kid now. Genocide. I thought all, I thought all the Spider Spider Man. Oh yeah, yeah. Mary Jane's black, so black. Oh, kid. in the movie, yeah. This new movies, they got a, a black actress. And oh yeah, so I guess we're rebooting Spider Man again. Sure, why not? What's interesting to me is that they keep redoing Spider Man because I think I think there's been some okay Spider Man films that weren't weren't terrible. <laughs> Unlike <laughs> Fantastic Four, which has never gotten a decent film ever. Which seems like it'd be so easy. I don't know how they keep fucking up Fantastic Four because it's like such a simple premise, you know. There's not. It, it doesn't even have like the the built in like as many built in like pathos requirements as Spider Man does. Like you know, the Uncle Ben dying, great power and great responsibility. It's like, well, here's these four people. They got these powers and they fight this guy. 
Well, yeah, so they're going to fight. Oh, who are they going to fight? They're going to fight this guy? Yeah, the, the metal metal boy. The metal Dr. Stuff, the, the metal, oh, yeah, they're going to fight metal, metal boy and not planet eater? Because that's that's usually where it falls apart. Actually, that's not true. There is one good, if technically non-canon, adaptation of the Fantastic Four. You're talking about the 1984 one? No, no, I was talking about the Venture Brothers. Oh, oh yeah. right, right, right. Okay, yeah, okay. I was going to say, the 1984 one's, like, uh, so bad it's good. Uh, Roger, it's just, that's the Roger Corman one, right? Right, it's yeah. absolutely insane. There's a movie that was made but never intended to be released just so that they could hang on to the Fantastic Four movie rights back back when comic book movie rights weren't worth anything. Right, well, like uh, Hellraiser 8 was made in two weeks because some intern was rifling around in the copyright files and found out, oh, hey, if we don't make a Hellraiser movie in the next month, we lose the rights to it. You could watch three and you'd be fine. You could watch four and you'd be done and tired of it. And then there's a bunch more, which you don't ever need to see. Isn't, isn't it one of those things like Die Hard where it's always just like a random script for another movie and then they just shove uh, Pinhead in there and call it a Hellraiser uh, movie? Uh, there's like a few like that. There's a few like that. I think there's one where it goes over the history of the Cenobites, which is kind of an interesting take on it. It's just like a massive origin story one. But there's a few where it's like, yeah, there's a hell house that people get trapped in and they're killing people in. And it was maybe the Cenobites at the end. Maybe. Maybe. The, maybe like, they make an appearance. See, like, I, and, I want to know how Pinhead got all those pins in his head. Well, he... Do you, do you, since I explained the, the lore of the Dark Carnival so well, I think I can do like a three-minute lore of Hellraiser. Uh, the Cenobites are from a pain dimension ruled over by the evil dark god Leviathan. They are humans, or formerly humans, who have discovered the incredible and exquisite beyond world pain and suffering that, that defies and breaks the mind and causes you to be, go go beyond the limits of your mortal coil. And they just want to do you a favor and share that with you. It's BDSM on a Lovecraftian scale. It pretty much is. They, and they're, they're just really, they really want to share the love. And it's going to hurt so good. And you might not make it. Was that in the yeah. first or second Hellraiser? There's a shot where like a guy's getting massaged by a Cenobite down in that hell dimension, and they just like as they're massaging him, they just like stick their their hands right under his skin. Yeah, they, they yeah. I mean, that's that's I don't know which one that's from, but that's the sort of thing they do, and they're 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 not malicious. I would say they're just determined. Ish. We're going to build a puzzle box around the pain dimension, and we're going to make the Cenobites pay for it. Yeah, uh, that, that'll be the plot of Hell Hellraiser 9. I'm sure of it now. I want to see Donald Trump solve that puzzle box. He probably, I don't think well, he, in he, any, he can. In any case, uh, there's the, that's, that's really how you find those so bad it's good movies. You look for movies that were made for production reasons, not for any other reason. The, 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 the things where this, there had to be a movie made and they had to find people to do it, not because someone came up with an idea for a movie and pitched it. Like, there had to be a movie made. Like the Atlas Shrugged film trilogy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Like for those reasons. And it is. Uh, um, well, and then and then there's a lot of European films in the '80s that got made because there were just these ridiculous art grants, and they were really easy to get if you said you were making a film, and you really didn't have to have a really solid pitch, but you just made a film and got some money. And then there's movies you make to lose a lot of money, and then write it all off as a loss. Oh yeah, like the like producers, like the producers, like the plot that of the that producers. Really that, that was yeah, the plot movie. of the producers. Yeah, yeah. Those are the best films. What, what movies have been done as write-offs? Like, I'm familiar with the concept, but I can't think of a... I've never heard of a movie that was done for that. Well, I mean, like I, I said, Hel of the the Hellraiser theaters. 8 is one I can point to really quickly. But, yeah, they don't have any sort of long run in theaters. They might be in theaters for, like, a week, you know. If they even get there, yeah. But Or what about those... I mean, I imagine some of those must end up as those... You know, like the movies you, you see at the bottom of the shelf in a video store back when they saw video stores oh, yeah. that have the, a title that's one word off from a movie that's really popular at that point. Right, like, no. Asylum pictures. Yeah, like tr I remember Transformers came out and then in the video Trans store there was Transmorphers. Transmorphers, yeah. No. But then reading the back of the box, the plot was actually from like a ripoff of the Terminator. Well, oh. you gotta start making those movies usually before the other one comes out in order to get their appropriate cash in yeah. and really know what the other one's about. Right. I think the reason I'm talking about this is because I ran a, uh, found a few old hard drives in my house and plugged them a in. A few. 
Yeah, from old computers. Whenever I uh, threw out or, or, or got rid of a personal computer, I always took the hard drives out and I put them in a box. And then I found the box. And so I'm finding files that I downloaded 10 years ago. Stuff I saved from Web 1.0 and really old movies. And I, I had a copy of Aliens that's like the size of your... The, the aspect ratio must be the size of your thumb. It was ridiculous. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, but in that, I found things like uh, The Lathe of Heaven, which was a sci-fi film filmed in Portland, Oregon for zero money. And uh, Death Race, Damnation Alley, um, Space Truckers. Have you ever seen Space Truckers? I've never seen Space Truckers. Is it like Dark Star? It's, it's very much in the same strain as Dark Star, where it is a comical movie that's fun. But it's not it's not space balls. So it's about it's about a space trucker and he has a shipment of square pigs that he's trying to get to uh, interpork and mm-hmm. things go things go kinda wrong for him. So so it's a good movie. It's worth looking at. The production I, values I, actually get pretty good. It's got a very young God, who's in that? Oh well, I've got a moment. Speaking of space truckers and people who were once very young, rest in peace, John Hurt, uh, of Alien. Oh, yeah. we- which is why I was watching Alien to watch him die. And die. actually, someone made a wonderful tribute to the career of Don Hurt, uh, which showed all of Did his you movies. Say Don Hurt? I'm sorry, no, it's a John. <laughs> Maybe, uh, well, the, the the reason is it showed every scene in a, in all of the movies he's ever been in where he's died, and he dies in almost every movie he's been in. Uh, oh, is he like? Oh man, he's like the original Sean Bean. Yeah. He, he, he oh, dies in so, that. so many movies. Who was, he in the Harry, who was he in the Harry Potter movies? I know he was in those, but I can't. I just watched them all for the first. God, time. I don't remember. Oh wait, was he? He was just like one of the instructors or something, right? Like he wasn't like a huge main character. I don't think he couldn't have been. He I don't remember. All of Vander. That oh, sounds wand, right. Oh, the, the, he's the wand he's, guy. He's the wand the wand maker. Sales. Yeah, he's the wand guy. Yeah. Well, right. I watched the Harry Potter movies like for the first time just recently because I'd seen the first two when they first came out but never really cared that much for Harry Potter but um you know I see a lot of like people you know infants uh in- mental infants on the internet being all like oh no Trump just took over the Ministry of Magic and now Professor McGonagall's Bernie Sanders or something so I was like all right I'll equate myself with more thoroughly with this mythology I, I enjoyed it Charles Dance, speaking of aliens. Oh, dude, know. Charles Dance owns. Yeah, Charles Dance is in Space Truckers as, um, as let's see. I Oh, he's, he's a scientist for the evil Ulta Corporation um, who design, they design something and that ends up killing him in hubris. So. As it always does. Yeah. Our listeners would probably, uh, all dozen of them, would probably know Charles Dance as Tywin Lannister from Game of Thrones. Right, right. He was the man and he died on the can. It's so <laughs> interesting to see a young version of him because he's still got the very distinctive facial features and sharp eyes, but he's very, very young. He's a very pointy man. He's a, yeah, he's a very well, sharp he, person. That's why he plays if, a bad guy, I think. If, okay. he fell, if he fell on you, he'd lacerate you with his looks. He was, yeah. um, you guys ever see Last Action Hero? No, but I made a joke about it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> you he that? was, yeah. he's, if, had that's a, actually a movie that I think it's, it's got a lot of problems, but it, I think it holds up. Okay. Actually, it's probably better suited to now than when it originally came out, mm-hmm. but, uh, he's the bad guy in that. Oh yeah. Should check it out. That sounds great. Um, it's it's sort of um, if no one knows the premise, basically it's like a parody. It's like got Arnold Schwarzenegger in it, and it's directed by John McTiernan, who directed Die Hard and Predator. And it's like a parody of Schwarzenegger action movies, like this, like this. It's a it's a made up Arnold Schwarzenegger action franchise that's that's sort of like a lethal weapon or something that's been going forever. And this kid who's a big fan and who's friends with an old projectionist for some reason gets a magic ticket and he gets transported into the movie to hang out with. Arnold Schwarzenegger in this kind of self-aware satirical way. Like there's a scene where Schwarzenegger goes home to his apartment and for no reason he shoots his closet up and then a ninja f- falls out dead. Ooh. And then hmm. the kid's like, how did you know there was a guy in there? He's like, there's always a guy in there. Oh, right. Yeah. Or, or yeah. There's like there's a cartoon cat in his police department and he doesn't think that's weird. Oh, baby. Here we go. Me, I need my little 
Um, I watched uh, just this weekend. I watched um, the first episode of The Lone Gunman, and I tried to share that with you guys because that's uh, there's conspiracies about it. Yeah, because that I remember. I have never watched The Lone Gunman, which for our audience was a, a short-lived spin-off of The X Files, which was created by Vince Gilligan, who would go on to do Breaking Bad. Um, and the show's fun. You can tell it's you can tell it's by Vince Gilligan. It's like watching an episode of maybe like if they made Hackers, the TV series, except they're all old guys, and they're you know you're not they're not ace detectives by any means, but they try to dig into shit and get into goofy situations. The first the first episode debuted in March of two thousand one, and the the plot of the first episode is that uh, one of the main characters' dad dies. And then they discovered that it's not he's not really dead and he's involved in this government cover-up of uh, a war game simulation called like Situation D12. And they find out that Situation D12 is a uh, terrorist hijacking on an airline. And if you've already seen where I'm going with this, the plot of the pilot episode, which aired in 2001 in March, is a recreation of 9-11. Like almost exactly. Like, literally flying planes into the World Trade Center as a government conspiracy. And yeah, that's how I know about the show, is there was, um, it was one of those five things that predicted 9-11 cracked article kind of deals. Right, but it is, I mean, you're watching it, and it just plays out in such a way, you're like, the, I, I, it, like it like made me almost sick to my stomach how, like, obvious it was that it's just like, they're gonna show me 911. It it's like they're they're gonna they're gonna do it. They're like, and it's not even like oh this is sort of similar. It's like this is it. This is Muslim terrorists they talk about, and like oh there's lots of despots in the world that want to take credit for doing something like this. And now nope, we're gonna fly the planes into the towers, and it's gonna and we're gonna send a sec. It's like it's crazy. And there's a scene where they they avert it at the last minute and the the pilot pulls up and it just nicks one of the dishes at the top of the World Trade Center and that's it. Man, if only. Yeah, it's yeah, they were kind of pussied out there. But it's so it's so bizarre to watch. And then you watch the rest of the episode and it's just goofy, goofy crime hijinks. Like to the point where like there's one episode where he has to live with an old lady and he needs to find a birthmark on her butt and it might as well be like some other fucking sitcom comedy. It's just so weird yeah. to see it. And the intensity of the first episode is completely different than other episodes. Other episodes are like, oh, we're going to investigate this local scam or uh, an ex-Nazi war criminal's in town. We're going to expose them. Like, it's just, 
it, it feels like it was written by a completely different person. And and is that like is it really that different an episode, or is it just your reaction to the plot is so different because been, it, it turned it was a thing that actually happened? No, it's been so different. Like I, there hasn't been another episode yet where someone's gotten shot or there's been like any sort of involvement from a higher government organization, they, like the CIA or the FBI. There hasn't been an episode where like the stakes have been as high as like you know, averting a, a terrorist attack. It's really bizarre so far, but I haven't finished the whole series. There was a game I used to play as a kid. It was called Urban Strike, and it was part of a series of, of games where you had an isometric view, and you just you flew around in a helicopter in a big map blowing stuff up. Sure. And they were awesome. And this one in that series, Urban Strike, was set in the then future year of 2001. And one of the missions is that in that year, 2001, the World Trade Centers are blown up, but by a space laser, not a, mm. a, a passenger liner. It's so interesting. And it, I mean, even if you look at movies like Ghostbusters, like the Twin Towers are just such an integral part of the New York skyline that I think people were drawn to attacking them. It's just or, like such a big part of the New York sk skyline that people see every day that if any part of that skyline, if the Empire State Building... Uh, or the Twin Towers or, or well, the Statue of Liberty went missing, it would be noticeable. And I mean, like, the destruction or the the uh, partial destruction or decay of landmarks is kind of, like, it's a really easy shorthand to evoke a feeling or say something, and that goes all the way back to, like, Planet of the Apes with the Statue of Liberty buried in the sand. And, oh, you, you oh, blew okay. it up! Yeah, you, you damn b The, the original Planet of the Apes with Charlton Heston. I well, think. the, uh, you know, I think it goes back further than that, and I think one of the reasons we don't see too many movies about things happening to the Empire State Building is because that was done to death. Like, King with Kong King Cop, yeah. it, Superman saved it from being knocked over a few times. Like, that used to be the go-to... So on the oh, someone's going to move a bomb in the Empire State Building, you know, and everyone got tired of that, so we moved on to other landmarks. Yeah, or um, Escape from New York, which had on the on the poster famously and never anywhere in the movie the big decapitated Statue of Liberty head mm. in the middle of the road. Well, we can look forward to uh, many other landmarks and things like that being ultimately destroyed and torn down shortly in the future. I think that's how how we're going to summarize this episode. Yeah. Sounds it's good. it is a time of of transition and destruction and um hopefully we survive this year intact but i guess probably not Pro uh, uh, yeah probably not i mean a, a a giant screaming sociopathic idiot has his finger on the button we're probably already enemies of the states anyways so awesome we're on a list all right well Homo Vulgaris signing off. Death to existence. Well, I'm headed down a southern trail. I'm going chicken hunting, jumping redneck chicken necks. I ain't saying nothing to the hillbilly. Put my barrel in his eye. Boom shaka, boom shaka, hair jumps in the sky. Why? I never like chicken pot pie. Or the chopped chicken and rye. Tell Mr. Billy Bob I'm a snack of slice. Poke, chop, chop, stab, gut. What can you do with the chicken?
Tick the bones locked in the cellar Yellow belly, chicken, pluck a 